there's this debate about what we should do about Libya and uh, some serious concerns about Americanizing it. On the other hand, you know, like, like you know, a, a dictator is killing his people. Uh, another cross current, we just killed nine children in Afghanistan. Apparently, I'm, I'm assuming it would, almost, it would have to be accidentally. And uh, Karzai is saying, no, I'm not going to accept your apology on this. We've got a, a, you know, a couple of real messes going on here. And then, you know, there's the Tunisian and the Egyptian uprising. And they seem to be genuine democratic movements. Now, whether they're going to follow the J-curve and, you know, dip down and then either come out as democracies or else come back out as autocracies, we don't know yet. But let's check in with an expert on this area. Peter Bergen is a, a, a New York Times bestselling book, The Longest War, The Enduring Conflict Between America and Al-Qaeda. And uh, he's also an, a veteran investigative journalist, CNN national security analyst. Peter, welcome to the program. Tom, thanks for the invitation. Um, first of all, your piece, uh, Al-Qaeda, The Loser in Arab Revolutions. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I say that, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden uh, must be witnessing all this stuff going on in the Middle East with a mixture of both glee and despair. Glee because, after all, regime change in the Middle East is what he's always wanted. Despair because, A, uh, this is not happening with anything to do with al-Qaeda or its ideas, and whatever the outcome is, I, do, I doubt it will be to al-Qaeda's satisfaction. After all, they want regime change in the Middle East um, yeah, and, and, and Taliban-style theocracies around the region uh, right. as the replacement. Right. Uh, that whatever which, else, which they're not getting it is so far. Anyway. They're not getting. They're not yeah. getting. And I, I think that's it's quite unlikely. Uh, you know, no one is marching in the streets of Cairo, uh, carrying a placard with a picture of Bin Laden. People in Bahrain are not spout, spouting, um, you know, Al Qaeda's venomous critique. Uh, there's no American flag burnings or Israeli flag burnings. It's, it's just not part of the whole deal. Mm -hmm. So. That's I, you know that's fascinating that uh, he and uh, Ayman al, al Zawahiri the uh, uh, who often is described as his number two. My understanding is that actually he's his mentor. That he was uh, a student of Qutb, uh who was uh, executed by was it Sadat, as I recall in Egypt uh, with the Muslim yeah. Brotherhood. Yeah, he was executed by by Nasser. Nasser, thank you. Yeah, I, I, the, and uh, but in any case uh, that that they're being marginalized. And frankly, I, I've always been of the opinion that had George Bush responded to 9-11 the way that uh, Bill Clinton responded to the bombing of the federal building, the McMurray Felder, federal building in, in Oklahoma City by branding the, the, the guy or people who did it as criminals and as psychopaths and going after them by law enforcement, we would have had a very, we would have a very different world. And, and that, you know, we could speculate on that forever, I suppose. But I'm curious your thoughts on what's going on in Libya right now. It, it, do we run the risk? It seems that there are three options. Um, one is to do nothing. The second is to declare a no-fly zone, uh, either unilaterally or with the uh, assistance of NATO. And excuse me. And the third is to actually uh, go in and bomb their relatively small air force uh, into uh, uh, impotence. Uh, what are your thoughts on those three options? Or are there well, others I'm missing, missing? Well, Bob Gates has already said that option two actually leads to option three. I mean, a right. no-fly zone means that you have to suppress their air defenses, which would include their air force. Right. Um, so you're either going to do nothing or you're going to have some kind of bombing campaign in Libya uh, that would involve taking out their air force and their air defenses. Right. Not unlike we did in yeah. Iraq. Not unlike what we did in Iraq. And in fact, I was just thinking this morning, Tom, it's an interesting thought experiment for... Uh, you know, I mean, Gaddafi, in a lot of different ways, is uh, not dissimilar for Saddam, a secular dictator who's uh, killed you know, thousands of his own population, um, comes from a relatively small uh, tribal group uh, that uh, has sort of been imposed on Libyan society. I mean, it's just a, mm -hmm. you know, there are, there are some, uh, there are, you know... Yeah. Uh, Took over by but, ruthlessness, but, trying to turn it over to his sons. Trying to turn it over yeah. to his sons, who turn out to be, you know, pretty... Um, a, a lot less saying than we can sort of believed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I just don't know the answer to that, Tom. It, it's sort of above my pay grade. I, uh, I'm a journalist, and, and uh, I'm not a policymaker. I think these are very hard uh, decisions to make. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, 
uh, we'd have to get, I presume, some sort of UN authorization, maybe some sort of NATO uh, uh, agreement. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can just snap your fingers and do this. Uh, you know, right. counter argument is Ronald Reagan, uh, after all, uh, practically killed Gaddafi in 1986 with the response to the Labelle disco attack in Berlin, where he managed to bomb some of Gaddafi's houses and kill one of Gaddafi's daughters, and that right. was done fairly unilaterally. So there is, you know, our own history suggests that we, uh, well, I mean, we've done this before, uh, maybe not on the scale of what but, would be required. But that was before we had most of the Middle East hating us. I mean, they, they, they disliked us because of our affiliation with Israel, but they, it, we hadn't bombed two Muslim nations back to the Stone Age. Well, I think, you know, I think that I, I would disagree with you about Afghanistan in the following, following way. I mean, that was the first time in, in NATO history that Article 5 was invoked by, the, by all the different members, a collective right to self-defense. Mm -hmm. There were very few, no Muslim clerics said, hey, um, this is a defensive jihad we're going to call against the American occupation. In fact, we were Muslim troops in Afghanistan right now, small numbers from Jordan and UAE. That, that war was conducted with a lot more um, buy-in uh, from around the world, including the Muslim world. The war in Iraq, of course, was the one that really sort of sabotage us in so many different ways. Mm. Um, enormously counterproductive. It gave bin Laden a lifeline. One of the things I get to, into in the book in some detail is um, Al-Qaeda's experience in Iraq and, and uh, how they uh, came to establish themselves there after the fall of Saddam and, and at one point ran a third of the country. Mm. Uh, but then they themselves inflicted a set of strategic errors on themselves and, and now are a pale a shadow of what they once were. Well, and in but, fact, in, um, pardon my interrupting. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say in the in the in the three minutes we have left, I'm I'm wondering I'm I, I'm I'm fascinated by your book, The Longest War: The Enduring Conflict Between America and Al Qaeda. Um, we're talking with Peter Bergen, and a New York Times bestselling uh, investigative journalist and bestselling author. Um, what what's the carry home message that you would like our viewers and listeners to have about your book? I, the carry home message is, uh, you know, one of the messages was that Al Qaeda was losing the war of ideas in the in the Muslim world, not because the United States was winning them. Certainly, as you pointed out, uh, we're widely disliked in practically every Muslim country, um, and and the reason for that is that you know they. Al Qaeda and its ally groups have killed a lot of Muslim civilians, and for groups that position themselves as defenders of Islam, this isn't very impressive. They also aren't offering any kind of uh, solutions to the very real problems of the Arab world, whether it's massive unemployment, underemployment. They've made a world of enemies, including any Muslim that doesn't precisely share their views. They won't engage in real world politics. And obviously, I finished the book before all the events in the Middle East were happening, but I mm -hmm. think they've simply underlined the conclusion, which is. Al Qaeda and its ideas just don't have, they're not really speaking to the Muslim world because they're not really offering anything concrete. Um, right. and, and the kinds of ideas that we're going to see coming out of Egypt and other places are, um, you know, it's Google executives and right. people who are on Facebook and, and also the Muslim Brotherhood and, and also the Egyptian military. But none of these groups are really influenced by Al Qaeda, luckily, and uh, I don't think they will be in the future. In, in, a, in a word, would it be appropriate to say that Al Qaeda has basically become a 12th century anachronism? I think that's a pretty good one. Yeah. The only problem is that, you know, we're living in the 21st century and 12th yeah. century anachronisms have a way of being able to communicate and, and um, get weapons and things. I mean, merely because they're losing public support doesn't mean that they're dead. Um, yeah. It's very true. Peter Bergen uh, and his website, peterbergen.com, P-E-T-E-R-B-E-R-G-E-N.com. Uh, his book, The Longest War, The Enduring Conflict Between America and Al-Qaeda. Uh, Peter Thanks so much for the great work that you're doing. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you so much. And, and for sharing your thoughts with us. I, I truly appreciate it. PeterBergen.com. Check it out. And his book, The Longest War.